So again, I would say typically if you are doing an audit and you were looking at the tanks, the SPCC program, the underground storage tanks, you're probably going to have this program too. It just makes sense. They all go together. You're looking in the same areas at similar things. So while you're there, it's kind of economies of scale. You can look at three programs at one time. So the used oil program, um, this actually also comes out of the RECRA regulations. Dan may have mentioned yesterday, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Um, used oil is not a hazardous waste, but it's carved out of the RECRA rules and managed separately under its own used oil management rules. Um, Georgia has its recycled used oil management standards, which basically incorporate by reference the federal used oil regulations at 40 CFR Part 279. And um, Georgia really hasn't added in any additional requirements, so you just have to comply with the federal rules. Won't read through all of these, but these are the various subparts and what they cover as far as the used oil regulations. Um, so what is used oil? Again, everybody's got their own definition of oil, used oil. They're all a little bit different. Uh, but in this case, used oil is any oil that has been refined from crude oil or any synthetic oil that has been used and as a result of such use is contaminated by physical or chemical impurities. It is not animal or vegetable oils. So your waste kitchen grease is not considered used oil. Um, the only program that that will be regulated under is SPCC, if it's in a container 55 gallons or more, or potentially the underground, no, not the underground storage tank program. The only one that could be regulated under is SPCC. Used oil is not kitchen grease. Um, so first of all, you have to know where you're generating used oil. Um, if you have any sort of vehicle maintenance facilities, you could be generating used oil. Um, your facility maintenance, if you have compressor oil changes out, refrigeration oil, uh, laboratories can be generating used oil from vacuum pumps. So really there are a lot of different potential scenarios for generating used oil on a campus. Um, used oil mixed with hazardous waste, what are the rules surrounding that? Um, mixtures of used oil and listed hazardous waste, and you all know from yesterday about the F, K, P, and the U lists, are managed as hazardous waste. And I don't know if Dan may have gone over this maybe when he was talking about the F listed waste or things like that, but this means any amount of a listed hazardous waste with any amount of used oil makes the whole mixture listed waste. And where we see this very often would be in a vehicle maintenance garage. Um, carburetor cleaner and brake cleaner uh, very often have F listed components in them, uh, trichloroethylene, things like that. And if you've got a facility where they may have done an oil change and they've got that oil pan and they're moving it now underneath the brakes, spraying some of this brake cleaner on and it's dripping into the used oil pan, take the used oil pan, dump it into the 55 gallon drum, that whole 55 gallon drum is now hazardous waste. Just from those few drops of the F listed brake cleaner, carburetor cleaner, whatever may have gotten into it. So really, really important to segregate waste streams, especially any of those compounds. First of all, you just want to get rid of those and switch to non-chlorinated compounds to be used in the garage if you can. Um, but again, any amount, even if it's a few drops, would turn the whole thing into hazardous waste. And again, the idea is so that you're not purposefully diluting a hazardous waste to make it something else that you don't have to regulate it that way. Now, characteristic hazardous waste, and you'll remember from yesterday that the characteristic hazardous waste are ignitable, reactive, toxic, and corrosive. If you mix characteristic hazardous waste with used oil and the resulting mixture exhibits the hazardous characteristic, it's hazardous waste. If you mix characteristic hazardous waste with used oil and the mixture does not exhibit the characteristic, technically you can manage it as used oil. Now what that means, say you've got some waste gasoline, which would be an ignitable hazardous waste. You mix a little bit of it in with your used oil. Um, actually, gasoline is probably a bad example because it also has benzene, which is delisted, which you could be exceeding. But say you had some sort of ignitable waste that's only hazardous because of it's ignitable. You mix it in here. If the resulting mixture is not ignitable, technically it's used oil. But you don't recommend that practice for a number of reasons. And we'll go into it here. Because sort of another exemption to the rule is if you're a conditionally exempt small quantity generator, um, and we only tell you this because it's in the rules, but we really, really, really don't want you to do it, and you mix your hazardous waste with used oil, it can all be managed as used oil. But it's not a good thing to do because you don't want to be mixing all sorts of different things and drums. You could end up with some sort of undesired reaction by doing that. 
And plus, the person who takes away your used oil may not be happy to know that it has other components in it that are going to mess with however they plan to process it, burn it, or whatever they're going to do with it. And I think Alex was saying that there was a campus recently that wanted to do this, wanted to mix certain amounts of paint waste or something like that with their used oil, and their vendor said, absolutely not, we don't want it because that's going to interfere with our process. So even though there is this sort of allowance for it in the rules, really don't recommend doing it. Manage your hazardous waste separate from your used oil. The rebuttable presumption. Um, this is a strange little rule in the used oil regulations that says if your used oil has greater than 1,000 parts per million of halogens, it's presumed to have been mixed with a hazardous waste. They don't want to give you the benefit of the doubt. So what you have to do to, to rebut that presumption is to test your oil with EPA test specified test methods to prove that the cons there is not have significant concentrations of regulated constituents. Um, you don't automatically just have to test for this, but if your used oil processor, whoever's picking it up, does some sort of fingerprint analysis and they say, oh, this has more than 1,000 parts per million halogens, this could be hazardous waste, um, you do have the option to run that second test and say, you know, no, it's just something in the oil, it did not come from a hazardous waste. Um, rebuttable presumption doesn't apply to metalworking fluids and used oil mixed with CFCs from refrigeration units. PCBs in oil. And again, Dan will be talking about PCBs later this afternoon when he goes over Tosca. But used oil with greater than 50 parts per million PCBs is regulated under the Toxic Substances Control Act, not as used oil. It's regulated as PCB waste at that point. Used oil that has less than 50 parts per million PCBs can be regulated as used oil as long as it hasn't been diluted from something that had a higher concentration of PCBs. Um, and again, this is just if you have any sort of PCB waste, no matter what its concentration as it is, and it came from something with more than 50 parts per million PCBs, it continues to be regulated as if it was 50 parts per million or more PCBs. But again, typically less than 50 parts per million, you can be used oil. There are used oil specifications, and if your oil can meet these criteria, it's considered on specification. Alternately, it's off specification. Um, and what you, the, you see them listed here, you've got a few heavy metals, flash point, and total halogens. And if you have less than all of these concentrations of these contaminants, you have on specification used oil. And we'll discuss in a minute why that matters. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. When I said exceeded, yes, thank you. Um, right, you don't want it lower than, you don't want to go higher than all of the part per million requirements. You don't want to go lower than the flash point. Thanks, Tim. So used oil management. Um, what do you need to do to manage it? Just like any other kind of waste, once you know you have it and you generate it, you're subject to specific management requirements. Um, in your binder and your materials, there's a really neat little table from EPA that lists what all of the management requirements are for a generator, a transporter, a burner. Um, so it's a really good reference. And for the most part, we're going to be concerned with the generator requirements, um, except as we you know, could potentially kick off into a couple other ones, such as the marketer requirements, which we'll talk about. But that's a nice summary. Um, used oil can be regulated under other programs, and we know that from the previous topics we covered this afternoon, and that if you're subject to the oil SPCC rules and you store your used oil in a container of 55 gallons or more, it's, it's subject to that planning. And if you store your used oil in an underground storage tank, it is potentially subject to that rule as well. Okay, so if you have used oil, how do you need to store it? Um, containers in above ground oil storage tanks need to be in good condition. Um, no major dents, no severe rusting, uh, not leaking, and containers, above-ground storage tanks, and fill ports of underground storage tanks all need to be labeled used oil. Exactly those words, not waste oil, bad oil, old oil, any variation. It must be exactly used oil. Um, just like when you're talking about hazardous waste and it has to have the magic words hazardous waste, it has to say used oil. And this includes used oil from laboratories. 
I mean, it's sort of easy to remember that used oil tank in the garage or the 55-gallon drum, but if you have folks collecting used oil in laboratories, they also need to have this wording on it. Um, as a generator, if you have a release of used oil, there are specific response procedures that you have to follow. Um, and these are a lot of common sense, but the rules spell out that you have to do this. Stop the release, contain any released oil, clean up and properly manage any released oil and clean up materials. Um, if necessary, repair the leaking container and tank prior to returning product to it. Um, and also note that while um, there could be um, additional reporting requirements if the container you have the used oil in is subject to either of these rules. Self-transporting. Uh, most times, you're not allowed to transport your own waste around, but generators can transport used oil they generate under certain conditions. And it can be used oil you generate, or if your campus happens to take in used oil from do-it-yourselfers, which are homeowner do-it-yourselfers who are changing their oil in their garage. Um, you're not obligated to take it in, but some campuses do that, or they'll have like a community day and they'll do a collection. Um, you can transport this type of used oil without obtaining an EPID number, although I imagine most of you will have one anyway. If you use a vehicle owned by the generator or an employee of the generator, if you transport no more than 55 gallons of oil at one time, and if the used oil is taken to a collection center that's authorized to accept the used oil. You can also self-transport to aggregation points. And again, you have to follow the same criteria, vehicle owned or operated by the campus or an employee, no more than 55 gallons, and in this case, you would be taking it to an aggregation point that the college owns. And where this might come into play is where you've got a main campus and satellite facilities, whether it be a field station, a research station, and they generate a few gallons of used oil in a year, not much, and they bring it back to the main campus to consolidate with the larger volumes there. Um, that would be allowed under these conditions. Um, if you don't self-transport, you have to use a transporter with an EPA ID number. Fuel oil marketers. Um, there are a couple of things that can pull you into the fuel oil marketer requirements. And they are if you send a shipment of off-spec used oil to a used oil burner, um, or if you claim used oil to be burned for energy recovery meets the specification requirements and is on specification. If you do either of these, you're subject to certain of the marketer requirements. Now, if you send your oil to a processor, like a safety clean, um, there's nothing more you need to do with your, there are no more requirements that apply to you. Um, these are just if you're using a burner or, or something else. Uh, most facilities, again, are just sending it to some sort of processor, a no-go is safety clean. But, assuming you do do some of these acti activities, um, if you send on-spec used oil for burning, you're exempt from most regulations, but you do have to follow these uh, fuel oil marketer requirements. Um, analyze the oil or rely on some sort of generator knowledge to prove that it's on specification and maintain records, obtain an EPID number if you don't have one, and for each shipment maintain for three years all of this information. The name of the facility that's burning your oil, the quantity of oil sent there, date of shipment, um, and a reference to the analysis you're relying on to prove that it's on specification. You don't have to keep records if you know what's going into it. You're talking about here where you're saying you're, you're relying on some sort of information to prove it's on spec. Yeah, as long as you feel that there's control over that container and you know what's going into it and somebody's not just coming in and, well, there's a drum, let me just get rid of this in here, you're safe in doing that and not having a log of what goes in there. I mean, you could always implement a log if you want to, but it's not required. But again, you've got to have a good basis um, to say that it's on spec if you haven't actually conducted analysis. And if you, you know, just to be safe, you could always do that and just put it in a file and then, you know, every so often perhaps retest it, although it's not technically required. Now to burn off spec used oil, this is material that does not meet the, the heavy metals and the flash and the halogen criteria. Um, if you're sending off spec used oil for burning, you're subject to the following marketer requirements. Obtain an EPID number if you don't have one. Burn the oil only in specified industrial furnaces or boilers. Uh, and maintain these records. Name and address, EPID number of the transporter. 
name, address, CPID number of the burner, the quantity of oil shipped, and the date it was shipped. Before the first shipment of off-spec used oil is sent to a burner, you have to get a um, certifying statement from the burner that they've notified the EPA of the location and general description of what they're doing um, and that they're going to burn the used oil only in an approved industrial furnace. Again, most people, um, not everybody, but most people are not using burners. Um, if you generate your own used oil and you want to use it in an on-site space heater, you're allowed to do that. And you're also allowed to take in from do-it-yourselfers. Again, when I say do it yourself, I'm talking about the household oil changers, not another regulated used oil generator. Um, you can burn those oils in a heater that's designed with a maximum capacity of less than 0.5 million BTU per hour, and the combustion gases have to be vented to the outside. Um, other things you can't do with used oil. Um, you can't manage it in waste piles or surface impoundments that could be subject to the hazardous waste rules. Um, and you cannot use it as a dust suppressant. You can't spread it along the hide of the side of the roads. I know in the good old days that was how you got rid of it, but not anymore. A um, couple of points I just want to wrap up. Uh, used oil really is generally a pretty straightforward program to audit. There's not a lot of tricky things about it. Um, first of all, you just find out what used oil is generated on campus from what sort of processes, where are they storing it and where are they managing it, and how is it, what is its ultimate disposition? When it leaves campus, where is it going and how is it being managed when it leaves? Um, look for any potential required records if somebody is subject to the fuel marketer requirements and they need to keep those records, look for those. Again, if they're sending their, their oil to a processor, there are no record requirements, but again, always a good idea to keep them. If you've got a safety cleaner, somebody coming, they're going to leave you with a record of what they took, how much they took in the date. You should definitely keep those. Um, check for the container condition. The containers are in good condition. Make sure everything is labeled used oil. Um, are they mixing hazardous waste with used oil? Um, if so, what is it? Um, what's going in there? Can it still be managed as used oil? Um, and finally, are they accepting used oil from other locations? Again, it's okay if it's do-it-yourselfer but not okay if it's another regulated used oil generator. On site, in your own, your own oil. How long can you store what you're burning if you wait until it's cold outside? To burn? There's no requirement. It's not like hazardous waste where you've got 90, 180 days, whatever, to remove it from campus or universal waste. There's no time limit. But again, if you're storing it, make sure you're complying with all the other potential SPCC requirements, everything like that. And again, you've got to have that small heater that you're using, less than 0.5 million BTUs, vent it, 